Hello again, and welcome to the master's voice. I am celestial and you are welcome to this channel to old and new subscribers alike. You are very welcome. This video is being premiered on BitChute, shoot, rumble, Brighteon, and for this moment on YouTube at the same time, if you are not subscribed to my other channels, please make sure that you do so because as we all know by now, YouTube is not always a conducive platform to have discussions about serious and important matters that we will need to talk about in the time that is ahead of us. And so today I have a prophetic word that I received. There is no date on this thing. I haven't put the date on from my journals, but it definitely was a word from last week. So it's not from this week that's now in the middle, October 19. This is a word from maybe the 10th, 11th, 9th, that time period. So I'll look it up. Um, in my archives. And when the prophecy goes live, the prophecy is not actually yet live on the actual blog. When the prophecy goes live, the title will be there and the date will be there. But the title of this message that I am giving is called two more good years. And this part is called an introduction. So this video is entitled two more good years and introduction. And I was about to make the main video that is entitled two more good years, but the Lord began to give me some serious Bible study, serious down downloads, collating a lot of things that he has been saying to me personally. So I've already explained that I am in the process of winding down um, the work that I'm doing on the Master's Voice blog. There are a lot of new people. You are welcome. If you come here to learn and you actually want to listen, then you're very welcome. And in a nutshell, the Master's Voice prophecy blog, I started it in 2019 reluctantly because the Lord told me it is high time that you now publicize the words that I've been giving you. The words that the Lord has been giving me, I've been receiving them since 2012. So the prophecies started being written down in 2012. And at the time I thought that I was simply hearing the Lord, hearing the Lord's hearts, writing down the things that God said would be. And the majority of those things I quickly realized involved the nation of America. God began to show me that he was not pleased with America. He was not pleased with the way that America abuses her power, the way America abuses her influence, the way America abuses her status. And this was all the way back in 2012. The Lord also made it known to me that we are in the final times of times. He said to me, Celestial, these are the last days. After these days, there shall be no more days. And words like that took me by surprise because of course, when you hear that, you think, well, the world must be ending tomorrow. But one thing that we should understand about God is that God is always led by mercy. God is always led by mercy. And the mercy in this case that God was showing America and is showing to all nations is that God is first going to take his time to lay out all the sins that the world is guilty of, that the church is guilty of, that nations are guilty of, and in particular, one pivotal nation that has sat at the middle of world events for at least the last 60 years, 60 to 70 being generous. God has been taking his time to lay out the case and the complaint that he has had with the nations of the world, with this nation, the United States of America, with mankind, with his own church. And so I was obediently writing those things down, thinking that I was just keeping prophecy journals until 2019 when the Lord said, bring out these prophecies, start with this bunch, this bunch being Russia and China prophecies, and then move in the direction and the order that I tell you. And so if you go to the Master's Voice blog, which is www.the-masters-voice.com, if you go to that blog, you will find a plethora of words that I have received over the last 10 years. I'm still receiving messages. And those of you who have been here for a long time, you may have noticed that the messages are coming faster and faster. It doesn't always mean that God is giving me new prophecy faster and faster, even though that is happening. It also means that I am doing my very best 
to finish the 460 prophecies that the Lord has given me. I'm doing my best. Having, haven't written most of them down. I haven't written all of them down. I still have a ton of unwritten stuff, but doing my best to put as many of them as I can into video format. Why? Because when I'm done, I'm going to leave these videos here. So I'm not going to personally be here. These videos, if you didn't understand what the purpose of the videos were, the videos are a support to the blog, but the videos are also part of an overall indictment that God has made against America. So I know there's a lot of people that say, oh, if we pray, God will turn it back. God's not going to turn anything back. I see people saying things like, oh no, if we pray, God will stop the wars. I don't know how in this modern age, we have a church that is so poorly taught or just so proud that people actually think that getting down on their knees and praying will stop the red horse from the book of Revelation riding. And I lay all these things, 90% of it, firmly at the feet of the pastors who have been pastoring people for the last um, couple of decades. Because these, these men and these women have given the church locally here in America, especially the idea that God is so in love with them, that God can never hurt them. God is so in love with them that God can never do anything to America because America is God's perfect child, his, 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 his teacher's pet. And he's always willing to kick the can down the road. Just another time with her. If she says, Oh God, give us another chance. Um, you know, we're murdering babies with the mail order pills now and all that, but just we can get right. And, and they don't understand that God is fully vested in bringing about the kingdom of his glorious son. So, so people love themselves and their lives so much that they actually keep thinking shamefully that Jesus will continue to take a back seat so they can carry on with mediocre lives lives that are largely not on fire for God, lives that are usually a mix of compromise, lies that they've been um, languishing in for I don't know how long. They really think that God is going to say, okay, I'll put the eternal kingdom on hold so that you guys can scramble one more time and get it right. We are in a completely different time period. And I, for one, I rejoice in the words of my king. They are not easy words, and I'm not going to hold anything back in any of these prophecies. My joy is completely separate from this work that I do. So the things that God has been saying to me personally have perked up my soul so much that even if I bring a prophecy saying here that Mount Kilimanjaro is going to blow up and sink an entire continent into the sea, I will deliver it professionally because it is completely separate from the peace, the joy, and just the, the, the blessing, the kindness that God has been showing me recently. Um, I could go ahead and say something from this prophecy. God said that here is the dichotomy of the prophet. He said that when the prophet is bringing forth the word, they will usually always meet thorns and briars, nettles, sticks, stones, mockery, and cursing. And he said that when this person is prophesying the word of God, it will never be easy for them. Many times their soul will be in pain and in torment because of the spiritual burden and the natural burden and the spiritual warfare that goes with carrying the true prophetic word. But he says, here's the thing, my child, is that when you lay down your pen and the work is done, then opens up a brand new vista for you. That's when the prophets begin to enjoy God's own reward, the fruit of their faithful labor. And he says, at the time the word is falling upon the people, the burden will be shifted from your shoulders onto those who will now be facing the reality of the things you say. And so in the Bible, historically, you will see the prophet will bring the word and people will curse and people will mock. And in the Jeremiah's case, they were always slapping him in the face. And I've certainly got my fair share of that or people at least who attempted to do that through their words. But the end of a thing is what proves the truth of a thing. When people are going through, especially old time viewers know, the stuff that I have covered here in the last three years, when it is confronting people out there, most people won't have the strength to raise their hand, much less throw a stone 
anymore. So let us go into this prophetic word. This is prophetic insights from the Lord. It is called two more good years, an introduction. And the reason it's called two more good years is because God says, America, you have two more good years, and then you are going to enter into the whirlpool machine, a literal washing cycle of destruction. And the primary theme that God was talking about is war. So civil war is coming to America and that civil war is not going to be turned back. That civil war, God says, is America's just punishment for her pride and for the hatefulness that is hidden deep in the hearts of people that will finally come to a head, bubble to the surface and break out. So in it's an old prophecy. I can't remember which one, but it was definitely either the very beginning of this year or around about the end of last year. God said that there is a false belief here that this is a nation of good people. And that's what I see often in the comment section. How can you say this about this country? Why are you so anti-American? Why are you so filled with hate? Don't you know there's good people here? And God said, excuse me, please. He said, who is good? Didn't Jesus say that there is none good except God? God said that you will see who the good people are when the money fails and the resources become severely constrained, when food is not enough for everyone. God says that America will see her good people picking up arms, shooting one another, pillaging one another, robbing one another. And let's not forget the many male opportunists who are going to be raping people willy nilly in those times. God says that you will see the true heart of this nation rise to the surface as brother picks up arms, turns towards brother and fires. And the media is going to be instigating all of that until it goes off. So just two more good years, the Lord says, and then the nation is going to enter into severe rocking turmoil. But before we go into that prophecy, which is a separate thing, this video is looking at things that God has been laying on my heart for a while. And now we're going to go into it with the help of the word of God. So the first thing he said tonight is the false prophets will rise, thrive, and flourish. So I always tell people that I'm extremely particular with words. When God says will, that means something is going to happen. So he didn't say the false prophets might rise or the false prophets could sort of. He said that they will rise, they will thrive, and they will flourish. They will multiply like wild vines and take the number appointed to them. So this means that there is, we've already seen it, but there is coming an unbelievable shock wave of end times, false prophets, false teachers, false pastors, false leaders that will fall under the heading of, if possible, can deceive even the elect. So the Lord says these people will multiply, which means that they will be 10 times more than they already are. And he says they will take the number appointed to them. Now, what's that number appointed to them? Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, verses 4, 5, and also verse 11, and look that up. What does it mean when the Bible says there's a number appointed to something. Well, that means there's a number that's already given over. It means that number is already set in heaven. It means that the only way to not be a part of that number is to be found where? To be found in that tiny ecclesia, the group of the true church that have sacrificed their own lusts, sacrificed their own desires, and have laid down their all at the feet of Jesus in humility. Why? Is it only to be saved? No, because they love him and they deeply desire to be taught of him. Most people do not want to be taught because most people are under the assumption that they're so learned already, that nobody can tell them anything. And then they become offensive when they hear the word of God that goes contrary to their understanding and their belief, because most people are fiercely protective of their own knowledge. They don't want to hear more. They don't want to learn anything extra. Why? Because learning requires humility. 
learning requires that you actually make room on your library shelf and remove your big fat books for maybe one or two slender volumes that could fill in the gaps to what you think you know. Many people do not have perfected knowledge of the end times because the pastors have deliberately stayed away from this section of the Bible. They have given the modern church internationally. I'm talking about all the seven continents. Well, maybe minus Antarctica. I don't know if they go to church there, but they have given people the idea that the end times are so far off. And they have successfully done this, that every generation of Christians truly believes that they're going to die covered up in bed under the covers going, obey your mother. They, they literally, people literally think that no generation thinks that they're going to be the generation that will have to face the horrors of the end time. But I'm here to tell you that in 2012, the Lord said to me, celestial, I am calling you to prepare me a people to meet me. And that means that the generation living, the generation who is watching this video, you are the generation. I am the generation that is going to meet the Lord and it will either be for blessing or for judgment. Matthew 24 verses four and five or verse three. Now he sat on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And then we just jump down to verse 11 where it says, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. So here Jesus is not saying that this is something that could potentially happen. He's actually saying that false Christ, meaning men who claim to truly be Jesus himself will come and will deceive many. And he says that with them will come false pastors, false prophets, people in the religious enclave, the religious circle who will come, but they will be false. They will be deceivers. They will be wolves in sheep's clothing. They will be living private lives that don't match up to a single thing in this book, but because they can dress up their speech with Bible verses and because they can really whip up a crowd, people are going to think that they're the real thing. And then what did Jesus say those people who think they're the real thing will get? Deception. The first thing that Jesus tells the disciples will be the sign of the times that he's coming is deception, deception and false ones in the church, liars in the church, deceivers in the church, charlatans in the church. So then where does that leave the people of God? That means that it falls upon the people of God to be discerning or they will be part of the number the Lord says is appointed to fall away to deception. So that means that number's there. It's definitely going to be a group that goes into judgment, perdition, and hell with the false prophets. The only, the only variable is who's it going to be? And this is the question that is facing the modern day church today. And they actually don't know that question is facing them. Sometimes I look at the comments and I am in quiet awe to see people who have gray hair think that discernment is asking me, who are you and uh, where did you come from and, and what's your statement of faith and, and, and uh, we're supposed to test the spirits of the prophets. And I'm, and I'm looking and I'm thinking, God, help these people, have mercy on, because they're not my people, they're your people, so help them. If a false spirit stands in front of you, did the Bible tell you that the test of the false spirit is to go up to the false spirit and say, hey, false spirit, I'm here to ask you personally, are you false? And then the spirit says, no, I'm actually the spirit of the Lord himself. Then how do you refute that? Discernment is exercised spiritually. Discernment is not coming up to the spirit to ask the spirit, reveal yourself. Discernment is actually going back to the Lord and say, reveal this to me. Is this of you or is this of the devil? The problem is that the modern church is blocked 10 times over in the ears. They have no ability to hear from God, to know through prayer, to know through fasting how to test a spirit. People actually think that the test is asking a question. How scary is this? in a time 
when Antichrist is coming to crush and trample the residue with his feet? How on earth will you go up to a false, to a, to a fallen angel, for instance, that is manifesting in a human flesh and then say, are you a person? Are you a real person? Do, do you think that the angel has like incentive to say, yes, I'm actually a fallen angel here to cut you to ribbons as soon as you open the door? Of course not. That's the whole point of deception. In order to unravel it, you need the Holy Spirit, not questions. But people don't even know that. So that just goes to show you how fallen and how decrepit a state the church is in at these crucial times. And this is not even a question of, did I get it right? Did I get it wrong? This is a question of, you can lose your life if you are not able to discern between false and true. You can end up in the number given over to those heading into the lake of fire. They are dancing a merry tune into that six billion um, degrees heat and you're following them like the Pied Piper because you can't tell. And if you think that the test that will save you is asking questions, then that means you have totally missed the point of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It means that you have no ability to hear from on high what is true. It means that when the word of truth is coming forth, you have a callous. That means a big hard layer over their heart that cannot even be pierced by truth for you to know. I sense in my spirit, this is truth in the inward man. If you have to ask a question, you're already sunk. This is part one. Part two, still in the false prophets, finds us in the book of second Peter. And we are looking at chapter two, verses one, two, and three. And I'll read, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. So this is a wonderful piece of scripture where God is talking about the sowing of tares in among his people, the sowing of false leadership, the sowing of false so-called prophetic vessels among his people. He said, people who teach falsely that will secretly bring in destructive heresies to the point that they end up denying the Lord who has bought their salvation in the first place. Do you know what this is saying? This is saying that a lot of the people deceiving you now, if you were to rewind them five to 10 years ago, they were actually walking in the true light of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is not saying that they came out of the bushes or they sprang out of the, the sparks of hell and they just came from another dimension to teach falsehood. He says, no, I am the Lord who bought them, meaning that I once knew them. They once had a name tag on them that said, Christ. I am Christ. But now he says that they've become false and they are sown among the people secretly bringing in destructive heresies. So these are people who know how to use a couple Bible verses to sprinkle into the lie, to make the lie palatable. Those of you that have dogs, you know that occasionally you need to give your dog medication and the dog isn't just going to show up and eat that chalky mess because it doesn't taste like the stuff dogs like. So all the skillful people, they buy sausage and they buy their pets favorite treat and then they stuff that medication in there and then the dog takes it and then after the food dissolves, the medication is released in the body and the dog is healed. Now, I just want you to reverse that. False teachers, false prophets, giving you your favorite treats, your little wealth transfer storyline when God is actually saying that to those who have ears to hear, the global economy is about to take even the strong men down to their knees. Women, you're gonna see your stubborn husbands crying in this country. 
I'm not speaking to any other country. I'm speaking to the country that loves filthy lucre. I'm speaking to the country that loves to play the markets, love to play the ponies, loves to play with cash. You women, some of you with husbands that can't hear, you are going to watch strong men sobbing when he is forced to come on his knees to tell you that the household is functionally bankrupt because he would not listen when you and the Holy Spirit were telling him, get your hand out of this card game, pack it up and move away before it goes bust. If you as the wife do not take some steps now to mitigate what's going to hit your household with prayer, fasting, and also squirreling away a little bit of extra, it's going to be tough. Because the thing with men is that they only stop when they are humbled. Men do not stop unless God grabs a hold of them the way he grabbed a hold of Apostle Paul and gave him the yank of his life. And unfortunately, even if he is humbled, the money is still gone. So this is where we are. God says that people have crept in to put medication into the food. And so you eat the food, the wealth transfer, and you eat the make America great again, and you eat this and you eat that. And what you don't know is that after the savory part dissolves in your mouth and dissolves in your belly, that spiritual poison that they have put in you is working and it is a destructive heresy. Heresies are lies that totally destroy faith in a Christian. Heresy are lies that rip away the foundational disciplines that keep us as strong pillars in God's house. When you are basing your beliefs on heresies and another person is rooted into the truth, when the storm comes, it's going to hit both trees. But after the storm leaves, we're going to see one tree ripped up and flat on the ground and, another, and the other one still standing because it was rooted and planted on truth and not destructive heresies. So this is actually the danger. This is how dangerous false teaching is. This is how dangerous false prophets are. This is how dangerous it is to go and sit and park yourself for 20 minutes in a place where people are having you do sing-alongs and where people are just telling you, oh, you know, I just, I just, I just know it's going to be a few tough things, but we're going to come through. They can never tell you the tough things. They can never tell you that God says that America is going to get hit by flooding so bad and that the death count that is going to come. I saw what happened in Ian and people were writing to me and telling me, is this, is this the, the water disaster that God said is coming to, to Florida? No, no one's going to be able to mail me after that water disaster. They're not telling people that God said that New York City is going to be under the water. You see, those are not the words that are coming because they don't have prophecy prayer calls where God is actually bringing forth live prophecy on the line saying that he will drown this city because it is complacent, because it is neck deep in sodomy and abortion and fornication and pedophilia and being complacent and trying to be welcoming and putting its arm around every form of idolatry and sin and saying, it's not sin. It's actually freedom. It's not sin. It's personal rights. They're not actually telling you the depth of iniquity in the country. So that's why it's easy for them to say, oh no, we're going to go through tough times. And here's their favorite saying, but in the end we win. In the end, only Jesus Christ wins. And by the time Jesus Christ wins in Revelation 22, a ton of people are dead. Most of them outside the Lord. If you are not reading the word of God for yourself and someone's giving you a little sausage with some poison tucked in the middle, then according to the frequency of how many of those sausages you take in, we should be looking to see you tap out before too many years have passed. Destructive heresies, it says, that have crept in among you secretly by people who have denied. They've gone so far in the lies. Some of these people have gone so far in the lies they can't stop. 
In America, you love liars so much that even when the liars were caught out in their lies two years ago, they swore up and down that God had told them that Trump was the man. He was coming back. It was guaranteed. And they went, when they were exposed to be liars, a few of them came and repented and all you went, we're all human because that's what God told you. God said that he would send prophets to you that were human so that when the word fails, instead of you going back to the test that's in the book of Deuteronomy, where it says, if the word fails, then you can tell that person is not a prophet. And after they've written four or five books, you bought all the books, you have the matching set at home. That set is still looking at you unless you were embarrassed and threw it in the trash about the glorious second term and the coming of Cyrus. All of that failed. They apologized and now they've gone right back to it and you're still subscribed. You are already a casualty of the times. There are people who don't even need to be deceived by the deceivableness of lying wonders and signs that are coming when, when the beast system stands up to crush people. They're already lost because they can be deceived by a man. So why would the coming of an evil one who prospers craft in his hand be necessary to destroy such people? The Lord says many will follow their destructive ways. And because of this, the way of truth will be blasphemed. False prophets, false teachers, these liars literally keep other people away from salvation. There are other people out there, they smoke, they drink, they fornicate. But you know what? Part of that is that they are cynical in life and they have two working eyes and they can spot a wolf in sheep's clothing on the stage of the potter's house better than the drooling acolytes inside the church who always say, touch not my anointed can spot. So there's people outside of the church who won't come into the midst of us because they hate the lies. They hate the hypocrisy. They hate the way we hug the pedophiles and cast the victims into the cone of silence and tell them, don't destroy Pastor Boyd. He's a good man. They blaspheme the way of truth. They literally curse Jesus because they feel that he's not a God that brings justice. He's just a God who gives a pass to all the sin that his church wants to commit. Because of them, the Bible says, and their destructive ways, who these lying heretical people that many of you can't stop following, you are as addicted to that no notification as these micro dosing drug people are who just keep taking these, these tiny doses of drugs to, to maintain, you know, they call it high functionality. Meanwhile, they're strung out on crack, but tiny doses of crack that can't be noticed. That's how some people are addicted to the notification of little things that scratch their itch. And so they can't come out of the trap. But God says that other people who can spot a scam, they blaspheme the way of truth. They blaspheme the way of truth. Where's the way of truth? The way of truth is in the church. There are people out there cursing against God and cursing against who he is supposed to be because the church that he has here now is not representative of him. It says by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. They'll say anything so that you can keep tossing them your coins. They will literally tell you anything. The fact that a channel like this has grown is indicative of the Lord's hand because there's not a thing here that could keep a person coming back and saying, I like to listen to her talk about how the world's gonna burn. So there must be something else here that people come for. The exhortation, the truth, the rebuke, the reminder that God is not your bunny pal, but he's a great and consuming fire. And you must be careful how you approach him because he is friendly, he is love, he cares for us, but he is not a toy. It must be that there is something embedded in this channel that constantly makes people come here because it's not feeding the sugar that other people are microdosing on. They will exploit you with deceptive words because they are covetous. And for a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. So now that I have opened the scripture up to you, you can see why God says that the end of false pastors, false prophets, false leaders, all false is death, is destruction. It says for a long time, their destruction has not been idle, meaning that the fact that you still see them standing on stages, you still see their channels up doesn't mean that God is giving them a pass. It means that each one of them has a cup 
that is filling. And when it is full, you will see the end of the verse. Their destruction does not sleep. The next part of this is just a little snippet that God laid on my heart to show people. A lot of people, they've been saved for a while. And I hate to tell you this, but um, your salvation is filled with a lot of dead wood. Your salvation is filled with a lot of fluff. It's filled with a lot of, please excuse me. Your salvation is filled with a lot of um, side chatter. So it's filled with a lot of stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with the dispensation you're in. Um, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it doesn't matter. Um, you could learn all the ancillary information in the Bible and still be okay. We had a lot of time, but as God began to show me how to read my word, I began to see that the Lord is not a butter knife. A butter knife is pretty much good for cutting butter and maybe cutting a warm roll, but you're not going to use a butter knife when you have to work on steak. Steak is what God has given me. Steak is what I myself like to eat in the spirit. I do not like watered down truth. I don't like milk. I don't like cornmeal. I need something to sink my teeth into because I know that I need to be robust because I have great responsibilities when it comes to the end times. And so let us go in our Bibles. If you have your Bible with you, let's go to Luke chapter three. And I'm just going to give you a little example on how you can read your Bible usefully and begin to cut out all the dead wood. A lot of people, the longer you've been saved, the more dead wood there is in you. You have a lot of ancillary side knowledge that isn't good for anything. It's not ever going to win another person to Christ. It's not ever going to stoke the fires of revival and understanding in someone. And if you learn how to read your Bible properly, you will actually get so much more benefit from it. So I'm going to read you a tiny passage here out of Luke chapter three, verses one, two, and three. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia and the region of Trachonitis, and Linus, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So let's imagine that it's Sunday morning and we are at our church of choice and the pastor this day has been moved in his heart to preach from the book of Luke chapter three. And he begins reading verses one, verses two, and verses three. There's a lot of names here. Let's go over them. Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, there's Herod, there's Philip, there's um, Lyn Lysanias, there's Annas and Caiaphas, who were the high priests. There's John, who's the son of Zacharias. This John would be John the Baptist. A lot of pastors will take this passage and preach it for about 30 minutes. Use up 30 minutes of your life telling you, now Tiberius Caesar was the fifth Caesar from Frank the Frog. And they'll be like, and Pontius Pilate, you remember him. He was the governor at that time. And hold that in your mind because it's very important because you're going to see the same Pilate pop up later when he's talking to Jesus and Jesus is not wanting to answer because Jesus is saving his energy for the cross. And then there's uh, Philip and you know a tetrarch. And then they will explain to you from the Greek and the French and the Chinese what a tetrarch is. And then they will also tell you about the region of Trachonitis, which was close to Greece, but a little bit underneath Iran and Iraq. And they will tell you about Annas, and they will tell you about Caiaphas, the evil high priest who was really gunning for Jesus. And they will use up 40 minutes talking about people who are basically dead and have nothing to do with the core part of this scripture. The only thing, and God gave me this thing, and I didn't even know he was testing me. He said, Celestial, go to this place where, um, John the Baptist was first starting in ministry. So I went there and I started reading and then he said, stop. And he said to me, what does the passage say? And I say, well, God, what it says is that a long time ago, a lot of people were hanging out in the government structure. But at that time, a particular word came into the mouth of a man who was going to help Jesus revolutionize Christianity. John, the miracle son of Zacharias, who went to the wilderness so you could prepare him for ministry. That's the only important thing in the scripture. 
Nobody cares about Annas and Caiaphas. They're dead and they have no further contribution to your health, wealth, and your ability to survive the end times. When you're reading the Bible, you need to be able to glean from it the passages that will feed you, strengthen you, and that will also feed and strengthen your wife. If you're a husband who does Bible study, as you should with your wife, and that will feed and strengthen your teen children and your young ones. Even the babies can be fed tiny granular morsels of the scripture, but only if you know how to present it. I look at the word of God and the spirit helps me to be concise. When you're studying you're drawing more from looking at John's life. The important thing, look in your Bible after this video, test it if you want. Go back to this part, Luke 3, 1, 2, and 3. The important part of the sentence is not Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests. It's not Pilate, the governor. It's not Tiberius Caesar, who doesn't even matter and who wasn't even in Palestine at the time. He was sitting in Rome, hating the fact that Palestine was such a rebellious place. The only thing that matters here is that God is saying, look how many names were in the government structure. Look how many names were in the elite. Look how many names were in high positions. Look who I spoke to. The lowly son of a temple priest, making him a highly weaponized man in my hands. And then verse three is the kicker. Verse three says, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You give me this piece of scripture and you give me 30 minutes, 25 of those minutes are going to be spent on how important it is to preach a baptism in which a man confesses his sins by repenting of the evil that he has done so that he can come into true fellowship with the Christ. The Bible has core truths and we lose them because we want to major on the minors. We lose them because we want everybody to know that we know the Greek, the French, and the Chinese version of the word. And yet we are in the end times. And sometimes you may have an encounter with a soul who needs to come to Jesus just the length of a train ride. And if you don't have the core biscuits in your hand to put into that starving person's mouth, you're going to miss the opportunity. You're going to lose them. And as the Bible says, your Christianity is worthless. Many of us don't even know how to feed ourselves. And that's why we can't feed the person next to us. We know that the airlines say, in case of emergency, put your own mask on first before you even trying to try to help your tiny little baby that you love. Most of us are unmasked, choking. We're on our last breath because we don't know how to read this book to glean truth. We follow little rabbit trails. We go into two hour, two hour um, research over who so and so mother, who is so and so's mother was. When the core things, the entire point of these three verses is simply to say that the heart of salvation is that you must preach repentance to take away sin. And yet when I say such things, then people will say, but the blood of Jesus was shed. The blood of Jesus was shed. And then what? The blood is going to jump on us to take away sin. We don't need to walk we don't need to walk submitted to the Lord. If we don't need repentance, then what is God always telling us to repent of? If sin is not a danger, if sin is not a coiled cobra waiting to strike the unprepared in the face, then what are we being saved from by Jesus? What has Jesus saved us from if it is not our sin? I move on with what else God said. God said that there's a new breed coming a new breed to replace this old, dead, pointless wood. He said that there's a new breed coming that will teach his word in power, in strength, authority, and will bring forth the wisdom of the Lord, irrefutable wisdom. You will not be able to argue with the way the new breed will teach, with the simple way that they will open the scriptures to you and show you stuff that was in there all along to save your soul. And the other breed before them could not do it. The Lord said their sound will be clear and their speech will be very plain. The only people who will not hear them are those who do not want to hear the next thing is this, the Lord said that we are entering and we have already come to a time of great deception and spiritual wickedness. 
and all the world follow the beast. How is the world going to follow the beast? How is this entire planet going to be led to opt into follow, following the beast and the beast system? And the word is simple. I talked about it in the beginning of the video. It is deception. It is controlling the mind with popular ideas, with propaganda, with craft. People, you have to understand. Let me read Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25 for you. Just a moment, please. I'll read from verse 24. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he will cause deceit to prosper under his rule. That word there is craft. And he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. So the word you hear used throughout this passage is the word shall, which means that something absolutely will happen. This means that you cannot pray the end times away. You cannot pray the beast away. You cannot pray aside the fact that it says he will have mighty power, but not by his own power. And how do we know that? Because Revelation chapter 13 in the first few verses says that the beast arose and that the dragon gave him his throne, his authority, and his power. This means that the beast will rise. No one will be able to stop the rise of Obama when he comes, and he will have power from Satan. So here is something that concerns me. The Lord will send a prophecy and reveal the name of this man and say that in the destroying time, this is the time when many Christians are going to be put to sleep against their will. God already gave the prophecy and said that many Christians, you will lose your life, not because you have done anything, not because you are at fault. He said, we are entering a time of unfairness, a time of murder, a time when the beast will simply have his 15 minutes of fame. They will hear a word that the Lord has revealed how this man will move. And then they will say, I just don't see it. I just don't see it. Evangelicals can see right through him and we don't like him. And I just don't see it. He has to be popular, you see. The Antichrist has to be popular. And the Bible says he will prosper by craft. Think of a serpent in front of an infant so this is a child sitting on its little bum bum. And this is an eight year old cobra. And this is the child saying, I just don't see it. I don't see it. Who is more aged? Who is more crafty? Is it this person that has a limited life stance, lifespan that in the beginning of the lifespan, they can't think. And as they edge into old age, they also can't think. Is this this limited being that only has a few years in the middle to show cognition and intelligence and has to learn? Or is it this thing that fell from heaven that in the movies they refer to it as the destroyer of worlds because of how destructive, crafty, cunning, and full of spiritual evil it is? Is it possible to hear that a beast will arrive empowered by dev the devil himself. And then the eight month old will sit and say, well, I figured it all out and I just don't see it. When a man prospers by craft, it means that he's coming with spiritual magic, sorcery and power that's going to cook the brains of everyone who is not humble. Everyone who's part of the I just don't see it crowd. Everyone who thinks that the outworking of these final powerful, sweeping, last days themes actually has to fit neatly within the four walls of the American political cycle. There are people outside this country that God has given dreams that show them who this man is. Not a single one of them are saying, well, I don't, I don't see how he could be welcomed by the church. He's going to cook the brains of the church because the brains of the church are going to be lightly steamed already by the coming of the false prophets who will precede their com the coming of their final father, the one empowered by Satan himself. By the time this man comes on the scene, people will be panting for his arrival. 
God has told me that most people won't even have their same memory anymore. Imagine that. A process that even I cannot explain because it has not been fully open to me, whereby the brains of people are wiped like a clean slate and all of a sudden your eyes behold something that you hated a year before, but now you love it. All the women who indulge in these Kabbalah crystals and the starter witchcraft, they know what I'm talking about. They know that when they want to get the heart of a man and he's not looking at them, they just run over there to Madam Ruthie's and they get a spell. And suddenly when they work that spell, because it is prospering by craft, occultism, sorcery, witchcraft, on a small scale, it's just meant for one boy. All of a sudden, a guy who wouldn't look at you is calling you and going like, I don't know, but you know, you've always been on my mind. That's how craft works. The one that it's working on just can't see it. Spiritual manipulation. Minds will be wiped, the Lord is saying. People's wills will be broken. I've spoken about the coming of the extraterrestrials into this world. And I said to people that when you lose someone, make sure as painful as it is that you ask the Holy Spirit to help you go through and complete the grieving process. Why? Because these creatures can pull data out of us. Just the way you go to a computer, just the way I go to my laptop all the time, and it does what I tell it. It responds to my typed in commands, and I can pull any data that I want off of my laptop. It's the same way these extraterrestrial so-called, they call themselves nothing but unclean, demonic, hybrid things, creations of the evil one himself. They can pull on human emotions and pull out of the mind. This is the image of the husband that she lost four years ago and she can't get over it. She's stuck in the grieving cycle. All the information about the man, how he talks, his body movements, everything is in there. They pull it out, change the outer shape, transmogrify and come to the door. And there you are, happy to see him, forgetting that the Bible says that it is appointed to man to die, to live once. He dies once and then after that judgment. It doesn't say he jumps up and comes back again and says, Marcy, I'm back. They found a way to bring me back. Anyone who opens the door to such things, this is craft prospering against you. These creatures have the ability to break the will of people. I said that when they extend their hand with their little creepy three fingers, I said it in the extraterrestrial video. I took an hour in prayer before I made that video that when they extend their fingers, they have the ability, God showed me, to mind cook an entire city. I saw one making a speech and the other one stood behind him with the hand extended, extended and the whole city had come to the meeting and they were clapping enthusiastically as they were telling humanity, we will make these changes, we will give you this, we will do this, whatever they were saying, the people had no recollection. It was like their eyes were open but shut, their ears were open but shut. They could hear and understand nothing that was being said, but they were on camera recorded as clapping and agreeing and saying it was a good idea. Agreement under coercion, duress, except one is in Christ wearing the full armor of God, definitely not a proud one who has views and views and views. I just don't see it. You won't see it until it hits you and by then it will be way too late. And that is the tragedy of speaking to a people that fit the description of Isaiah chapter six and verse 10. The removal of re religious icons, God was saying, those who don't humble themselves will be destroyed. And God says that judgment is here now to purge the church. The untouched hand. This means that people who have not received their judgment up to now, I already spoke about that in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1, 2, about 3 or 4. The untouched hand, those for whom judgment has not slumbered, but up to now, we haven't seen God do anything to them, and they seem as if they're existing under a charismatic cloud of God's own love. Many of these people, they seem like God's own beloved, but these people are already rejected. 
They are rejected. They are cast off by the Lord. You just can't see it because the hour of their judgment has not yet come. And so they continue to move about as golden boys and golden girls. But God said that the hours of the untouched hand, that our hand has struck. And now leaders will be forcibly retired by the church. This is one of the types of being sat down. God said that church leaders, they will be retired by their own church. They will be retired by the board of elders. They will be retired by the deaconries. The deacons will go on strike and make such a stink that the pastor will have to resign because of whatever it is that he has done, whatever it is that he is guilty of. God says even by popular vote, some churches are actually going to sit down and vote their pastor out, vote of no confidence. God says that in some cases, they will be forcibly removed and sat down. This is him. God says he will sit people down. God gave me the prophetic word um, last week when I was away, and he said that in some cases, his mark of disapproval will be when somebody drops dead in the pulpit. They're literally going to be telling you, let's turn in your Bibles to this, and they're just going to go down a thud. And the Lord says that that loop, please hear me, God says that loop will be played again and again and again because this is a merciless world of social media. He says, you disrespected me. This is the word that was coming through on that live prophecy prayer call. So many of them, every day God has something to say to those of you who think that if God hears from someone every day, then they're lying. If you don't hear from God, Every day you need to clean your spiritual ears because it means that your relationship is nowhere and where it needs to be. God is a day-to-day, moment-to-moment GPS for the faithful. You don't even have to be built like me. If the last word God gave you was in the 1980s when you got saved, there is a severe problem with your spiritual ear. You need to cry out to him in prayer and fasting for mercy Because this is the time, and many Christians are struggling with this, this is the time where Satan is going to cloud the spiritual atmosphere so much that you won't be able to hear God through your fear, your doubt, unbelief, panic, stress. People will be struggling to get a word of God, and they're not going to be able to get it. And part of it is because the spiritual atmosphere is putting a squeeze on people like never before. Veterans in the church, longtime prayer warriors, they are telling me that they are struggling to hear what God is saying to them. And they're asking me. And then people are saying that hearing God every day is fake. How sad and also how scary for those who think this way. God is saying that when he strikes these people, They disrespected him. His disrespect is going to be striking them in the middle of a sermon. When people think this is God's anointed, oh, look at how he's climbing the hill of ascension, breaking open this passage, he's going to drop dead. And God said that phones are going to record. The live cameras are going to be carrying that loop live into thousands of homes, millions of homes on that live stream. And people are going to play it over and over. God says that the end of some pastors will be to become a meme on Twitter, TikTok, social media. You will be viewed 50 million times, 60 million times. That's how you're going to go out on live TV. And God says to tell the church, you need this shock because you are in a stupor, captivated to men, man worshipers. You like people more than you like me. You follow these men and have forgotten to follow me. Whatever they tell you, you believe it. You don't even know the truth of the word. You cannot break open the word for yourself and feed yourself. And this is why you feed on lies and you are filled with emptiness and wind. There's nothing in your belly. You are already given and cast away as prey to the evil one who is coming to prosper among you with craft. Imagine. Imagine this being the end of someone who claims to be born again, who claims to be saved, and this is how you go out. Either the pastor who becomes a meme or the acolyte, the the iconizer, the one who iconizes false pastors, false politicians, false everything, and follows after their footsteps into perdition. 
God says that people will be forcibly removed and sat down. And he said that some people will be sat down so hard that they're going to end up in wheelchairs. The Lord said to me on that call, and I repeat it here now, celestial, I'm going to put some of them in wheelchairs and they'll never stand behind the pulpit again. They'll still be alive, mind you, but they will never stand again. God says that some will go down in shame and scandal. Many of these places, God said that TBN is going to close down. They're going to have a huge scandal in, in, involving money. They're functionally bankrupt. They don't have any money, which is shocking for people who have been collecting money for close to 40 years. Their books are cooked. And he said they're going to go down in scandal. And so with the potter's house, the whole edifice of the potter's house will go down. God says to tell you that T.D. Jakes is the striking of the hour hand upon the hour. When T.D. Jakes is removed, know the time of the judgment of the ministers has come. God says that political icons and idols will fall the same. I have been laboring in the huge glut of prophecies concerning Donald Trump that God has given me over the last four to five weeks have been busy and now starting to put them up methodically one after the other. God going through the reasons of why America, you will not get the ending you want concerning this man. God says, America, you will learn a lesson through Donald Trump, a lesson that will end in chastisement. And the prophecy for that lesson was put up, I think, yesterday. It does not have a name, but it does have, it doesn't even have a date. Um, I was working on that at 2 a.m., and so I didn't get a chance to, to finish that. But I will. Um, it's, it's pretty early now. I will, I will correct that. And so that prophecy has already gone up. People will be the canary in the coal mine. God says that the church needs to be shocked back to reality, that the church is in a stupor, that the church is so full of false everything. And so you've heard the word of the Lord here, what the end times are really like. What is actually required from a Christian in the end times? Is it that you remain deceived? Is it, is it that you, you fight for what you know, the little that you know, the wrongness that you know? Is it that you cling to that because you think that um, you can't be bested? That's, that's a strange thing. People actually think they're in a competition with me. I, I have to show her what I know. And, and you don't understand that. Oh, I will just go ahead and, and say that now. Is that I, I am on actually a, a, a timeline for finishing this at last. I'm on a timeline for finishing this. And then after that, the prophecies will sit here um, as a testament to my faithfulness to God. Um, it doesn't mean that I finished everyone, but uh, the Lord has said certain things to me. And um, all I will share with you is, is that if, if you are at this point, if you have made it to this point in the video and God has been telling you to do certain things, God has been giving you the push and telling you that this is not really where I want you, that you're not actually maximizing your potential here. You've been hearing the Lord, but because of fear, people, the church is so full of fear. It is amazing. You have one life to live and then you're just going to let this bulldozer of fear just eat away all the pieces of your cake. So you're just going to, because you're so scared, you're so scared to fail or you're so scared to try that you're just going to sit there and let fear win. And you forget that when you die, you step into eternity and then he will call you next up. So-and-so come forward. Good to see you, my son. What did you do with the life that I gave you? I gave you three and a half talents. Didn't quite give you four. Didn't quite give you three. I gave you three and a half. What did you do with it? And then you stand there and say, oh, I knew you were a hard master. And on top of that, the economy wasn't favoring me. And I was really scared. And so I buried it in the ground. What does the scripture say? Depart from me. You wicked servant. Notice he didn't say you sloppy servant. Notice he didn't say, oh, you wasteful servant. He said wicked, which means it is wicked to sit on your gifts and your talents, sowing your time to self-doubt, low self-esteem issues, fear, what the people around you are saying. Who has time for what people say? Oh my goodness, I would have stopped at the third prophecy if I cared what weirdos are writing in the comment section. Who cares? You hear the voice of the Lord and you're still step, hesitating to step out of the boat. That's why there were 12 apostles and only one actually got to know what water feels like under the feet of a man. No matter what you want to say about Apostle Peter, he's the only man besides Jesus who knows what that feels like. 
because he was able to step out of the boat based on the fact that the Lord said to him, come. And he stepped out on that word and stood on it until he began to doubt. There is no time to live your life according to the comment section. Who has time for that? The peanut gallery and their endless opinions. Who has time for that? God has given me leave to do other things and I grasp it with both hands. I can't wait. So the timeline I have set, I may be re releasing two videos a day or just one, but I am doing my very best to at least bring out major themes like the beast system, the automated world that is coming. God gave a scary prophecy. It, there's no easy way to deliver that prophecy. It is not soft on the ears. And when I put it up, I'll make sure to put in the comment section that you really need to listen with a good brass shield on your heart. Embrace yourself. Have a cup of cocoa or something. It is not simple. And that is what God meant. At the time the word is coming forth, it is like coals on my head. And that is what most of you don't understand. You are actually getting a very sanitized version sometimes of how God actually speaks. The power and the anger that he comes with, you would not be able to take it if he said face to face, America, what he really thinks of you. God calls this the waters of Shiloh. You that thinks this is tough and unhandleable and she's so scary. This is the waters of Shiloh, the little creek that flows gently. Because when that raging river called Jesus Christ shows up to begin to fulfill these prophetic words, people, you'll be looking for me and saying, no, just like they told Moses, no, he mustn't talk to us. Moses, you talk to us. We, we don't want to actually talk to him directly. When he shows up to begin to do this stuff that people are accusing me, it's my imagination, I'm making it up. Who has an imagination this rich? Have I ever been to Russia to be able to describe to you even the personality of the man that is there and to describe it accurately from as far back as 2019 before ever Russia and Ukraine hit the news? What do you think this is? That I'm watching TV to bring these things to you. I'm watching a TV that's out of your sight. I'm watching a TV in the middle of the night at 4 a.m. And the heat of these words is upon me, but that is only momentary. When I finish, that heat is going to be transferred out there into the greater world. It won't be on me anymore. And then we will see in whose authority, in whose name, and by whose power I spoke. See you again soon with the second video. This is Celestial with, from the Master's Voice. God bless each and every person who is tuned in, who watches the videos to the end. If you share the videos, God bless you. If you're too scared to do so, it's time for you to deal with that spirit of fear. You have one life. It is time to stand up and do whatever it is that God has called you to do. The title of this prophecy, do not forget, it is called Two More Good Years, the introduction. I'll do the Two More Good Years prophecy in a while. I just need to publish it first, and then I will make the video. If not today, definitely tomorrow. Till I see you again, God bless you, all those who support the ministry. May the Lord infinitely strengthen your hands and return your seed back to you because you have had the kindness to sow it into good ground. I love my Jesus, and may he love you back. Until I see you again. Goodbye.